All right, today's scripture passage comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. And uh, we'll be reading this in the NIV. Uh, we'll be doing a, uh, a call and response, an alternate reading, which means that I'll read the first verse. And then uh, you, all of us together will read the second verse. There's only three verses, and then I'll take the third one as well. And so uh, as you're ready to read the scripture, uh, the, the Pew Bibles are NIVs. Uh, you can also look that up in a, uh, in a Bible app or if you brought a Bible. Um, but as you are ready to read, uh, we, we invite you to stand as able for the reading of God's word. Again, it's Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, like we said, friends, uh, this sermon series is called Metanoia, Everything Changes. And uh, we have been talking about this idea that things are supposed to change in your life, right? And uh, uh, I was kind of reminded... Uh, of this fact of how this should change um, the way we live. It should change the way we talk. It would change the things that we share with people. And uh, this past week, I was meeting with the adult group, and we were talking about the difficulties that a lot of uh, uh, Christians have with evangelism, right? Sharing your faith as we think of it. And um, you know, this is something that I think brings about a lot of guilt for a lot of Christians, that, that we're not doing it enough. And I, I, I've been kind of reflecting on this, and I think one of the reasons why evangelism is so hard for us, uh, sharing the gospel, is because we fundamentally misunderstand what gospel means. Now, when I say we misunderstand what gospel means, I'm not talking about this sort of religious statement that we think of as gospel, the particularity of the gospel as some kind of, uh, you know, religious belief, but the actual word gospel, right? Does anyone know what the word gospel means? Just, just the, the plain meaning of it. Good news. Okay, good. Yeah, it comes from uh, an old English word, Godspell. And uh, what that means is literally good news. Uh, that is the Old English translation of the Greek word euangelion. That's where we get our word for evangelism or evangelist, right? It literally means good news. And so an evangelist is someone who is good newsing, right? In the, the ancient world, they were heralds. They were like, you know, town criers. Uh, before the internet, before newspapers even. The way that people share news is a herald would go to a town center and just be like, hear ye, hear ye. Let me tell you the good news or bad news or whatever it was, right? And they would just be carrying news, right? And so, brothers and sisters, I think the problem for a lot of us is that our gospel is not really good news, I think that the way that the gospel um, sort of gets presented now and sharing the gospel is kind of like this. It's like a very mechanical thing. You know, you have to understand what this means. And whether or not you really think it's good, you need to share it. You have to share it. If you don't share it, you're a bad Christian. And it's like, oh my gosh, this creates so much guilt for us, you know? But the thing is, brothers and sisters, what I have been uh, finding out about myself is I gospel all the time, and so do you. Right? Maybe not about religious things, but don't you gospel about things that you're excited about? About things that have changed your life? You know, I don't know, maybe you saw some movie, you're like, oh my gosh, this movie changed my life. And you tell all your friends about, oh, you gotta see this. Oh man, this new Netflix show, it's so good. Let me show you this cat video, right? Maybe you're gospeling about these things and just kind of fittingly, I, I, I was looking up uh, uh, sort of, you know, what good news looks like. Oh, there we go. <laughs> good news. And 
Uh, this was just in my Google image search. When I looked up good news, uh, there's like lots of pictures of newspapers and then there are these two cats. And I was like, let's put up the cats. That's more fun, right? If you hear good news, right, it might turn a sad cat into a happy cat, you know? And, uh, you know, so one of the things that I noticed um, is that when people haven't seen me in a while, uh, usually what they'll comment on is the fact that I've lost uh, a good bit of weight. Yesterday we went to this, uh, uh, we had this revival, this English ministry revival with different churches. And there were, so, uh, there were a lot of folks there that I haven't seen for a while. And so a lot of people commented, they're like, Pastor Steve, did you lose weight? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I have. Uh, and, and so I, in, in the last year I've lost uh, uh, maybe so, somewhere like 22, 24 pounds, something like that. Um, and, and really in the last five months, uh, I've lost about 12, 13 pounds, right? And not only that, but my cholesterol has gone down 61 points in, in about uh, six months, right? And so usually when I tell people that, they're like, what are you doing? Right? And I'm like, let me tell you. And I'll tell them about my crazy diet. I'm doing this crazy diet. This message is not about my crazy diet. If you want to know about my crazy diet, I can tell you later, right? But brothers and sisters, I find myself sharing this like once a week, sometimes more than once a week, right? So probably some, some of my friends and family are, are sick of me talking about, gospeling about my diet, right? But it's something that I'm excited about. It's something where I've seen results in my life. And so I just share about it, right? And brothers and sisters, I wonder, are we, when we share the gospel, really evangelists, people who are witnessing good news, that we believe it's good news, or are we just actors? <laughs> Have you ever seen like, uh, like testimonials in commercials where there's like famous actors that are like, oh, you should try this special yogurt, right? It, it, it's like, you know, uh, it's changed my life, right? You know, they're, they're talking about some, uh, uh, they're, 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 you know, doing an advertisement for some product. You know, oh, you should eat Doritos, you know, they're delicious or whatever. And I think for a lot of us, we wonder, are those actors, those famous people, actually using those products? Or are they just getting paid to act like they're using it, right? Like they don't actually believe that those things are good for them. They haven't even tried it, really. But they're just paid money, and so they're, they're professionals, right? And they can kind of play it off. They can look like they're happy. They can look like this thing changed their life, right? And brothers and sisters, for me, and, and when we talk about the gospel, fundamentally, I believe we need to understand it as good news. That's what today's message is about. You know, we, we might have uh, messages in the future about really how you share your faith, but I just wanted to bring up the point. It's supposed to be good news, right? It's supposed to be something that's so easy for you to share because you're just excited about it. It's changed your life, right? This whole sermon series, we're saying metanoia. This is the journey of the Christ follower. Everything should be changing. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Are things changing in your life? Do we have an expectation that they change in our life? Because they should be, right? Um, there, there's this passage in uh, 1 Peter uh, 3.15 that talks about um, sort of this idea of, uh, so in 1 Peter 3.15 it says, uh, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And a lot of people use this passage when they talk about evangelism, about, about gospeling, right? You should always be ready to tell people the reason why you have so much hope in this world. You have so much joy in this world, right? Right? And so my whole point of today is to just kind of try to convince you to try to experience more of this good news for yourself, for you to really want to hunger to have this be good news for you, that it will start to transform your life. And brothers and sisters, when I see the gospel taught by Jesus, that's what I see. I see truly good news. 
So again, as we go into this, I know that the word gospel carries a lot of baggage for us, right? But I simply am going to treat the gospel as it is treated in the actual meaning. I'm going to treat it as good news. So let's take a look at uh, the passage that we read, it's a short passage, just three verses here, um, of Matthew 4, 23 through 25. And it tells us, again, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel. Again, what does that word mean? Good news. Amen. The good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And so, brothers and sisters, as you know, when you have the word and, there's that, that, that's a connecting word, right? Two things are being put together. So you have two things that are meant to exist in the same breath, in the same sort of action here, right? You have Jesus proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and he's healing people. And so what I want to propose to you is that the healing is an expression of the good news of the kingdom. Remember, we said good news, it just kind of sells itself, right? If it really is good. You know, when people are ready to hear it, they're, they're going to want to ask you. You know, especially, you know, let's say there's someone who's had a lot of frustrations. I'm just going to use the diet example. You know, they see someone who's lost a lot of weight. And, and, and you've tried to lose weight, and you haven't been able to. And you might want to ask that person, hey, how'd you do it? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you the good news, right? And people are just going to want to hear. They're going to be attracted to it. And here we see all these people. This is how the passage ends. Great crowds followed him, followed Jesus from Galilee and the Decapolis. The Decapolis is a region of 10 towns. People from all over and from Jerusalem, the capital city, and Judea, an entire region, and from beyond the Jordan. They're coming from all over. They can't get enough. And why are they following Jesus? Because he has good news. Now, some of you are like, Pastor Steve, it's not just about the good news. It's that he's healing people. It's because of the miracles. Yes, it is, isn't it? What if I were to tell you that the healing is part of the good news? That those two things are inextricably connected. We misunderstand this when we think of the gospel as one particular thing. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to say something that I want you to understand in context. The gospel that a lot of us are presented is good news. It is definitely good news. But remember, the word gospel is just a general term for good news, right? So can there be many gospels? Well, yeah, but definitely in the Bible, there are times where we just use the shorthand, the gospel. And it's not even explain what that is. We just say, you know, Christians suffered for the gospel. Right? And so what I want to present to you is the gospel that Jesus was bringing. The gospel of the kingdom is an all-inclusive gospel. For maybe a gospel that you've heard preached, maybe a gospel that you have been taught, and, and I, I want to argue or, or try to make the point, argue but in a very respectful way, right? We're, we're not going to raise my voice. I'm not going to yell at you, right? I'm not going to point fingers. not going to make you feel bad. I just want to convince you that maybe that's just part of the story, right? So friends, the, the story that you've heard, probably, and, and by the way, this is absolutely true, this is absolutely the good news, is that Jesus died for your sins, right? He died on a cross as a, a substitute, as a sacrifice. We call it substitutionary atonement. We were supposed to die because of our sins, and because of what Jesus did, he took the penalty. Right? That's why we call him the Lamb of God, because that's what the Israelites used to do. They used to take a perfect, unblemished lamb. And so Jesus is the sinless Lamb of God that takes away all the sins of the world for all time. And because of that, because the penalty of sin is death, you will not have to die. But now you have eternal life. Now, I think that is absolutely the gospel, like I said. There's a problem with that gospel, or should I say a limitation? The limitation is almost all of that 
is reserved for after your life. It's the afterlife. That's why we call it the afterlife. It comes after your life, right? And so if you think that that is the gospel and you believe in that as your gospel, then probably that gospel is going to do what that gospel does, only affect your afterlife. Maybe it will give you a little bit of joy, you know, to think about it now and then, to think, oh, after this life, I'm going to get to be with God forever. I, I'm, I, I hope that gives you hope. I hope that helps you. But brothers and sisters, has this been your experience? As many of you have grown up in the church. Many of you have heard that gospel. Many of you believe that gospel. Does it change everything? I, I, I know I'm treading on some <laughs> sensitive ground here. But all the research that I've seen in my own life and, and from serving, I, I've been in this church for 14 years. I've been doing pastoral ministry for almost 20 years. And all that I've seen is that that alone, I, I, I know this is a little controversial, but stay with me for a moment, that that alone is not enough. Because I want to argue that that's not the total gospel. It's part of it, right? Because, by the way, when does Jesus die in the gospels, the actual gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? When does he die? So if the gospel is Jesus dying on a cross and getting resurrected, right, then basically our gospel is only the end of the story, right? Why the heck do we have all of these stories of Jesus healing? and sharing parables, and going out and recruiting disciples if the only thing that matters is his death and resurrection. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a very, very important part of the story. It is part of the story. But, I mean, seriously, I, I, like, shouldn't our Gospels just be, like, it should be, like, five times quicker to read, you know? There should be, like, 85% less to read if that really is the Gospel. You know, and I shared this, uh, uh, Scott McKnight said this once. He said, could it be that the reason why we call the gospel according to Matthew, the, mass book, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according, according to Luke, according to John, that we call those gospels is because they are. That's the gospel. The whole life of Jesus. The whole ministry of Jesus. Not just the end. And the whole life of Jesus, the whole message of Jesus, actually the main message of Jesus, and I've, I've been trying to argue with this uh, point since September, you know, and, and hopefully you know this by now. The main message of Jesus, the most consistent thing he talks about, from the moment that he bursts on the scene, the first thing we're ter told that, that he preaches is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens, is at hand. It's available to you. It's come. His most persistent message is about the kingdom of God. And the reason why I'm trying to make this big elaborate point, right, is that that is the way that we can understand something that, that, that probably for many of us has been very, very mysterious. Why does Jesus heal people? Because again, brothers and sisters, let's be clear. If your gospel is only about you dying, it's only about after your life, then who the heck cares what happens to you while you're living? Right? Why would Jesus have to heal you of a sickness that is occurring while you're alive if the only thing that matters is your death? It makes no sense. But if you understand the gospel of the kingdom is not just for after your life, it is about this life too, then healing sickness makes perfect sense, right? What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the place where God rules and reigns, right? That, that, you know, as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. In other words, this world, our lives, should reflect the reality of God's reign. If God was completely in control, if God could make this world exactly as he wants it to be now, right now, that would be what we call the kingdom. 
And so when you start seeing, seeing, seeing things like illness, you see cancer, you see all kinds of broken things in this world, you look at those things and there's a part of you that, that, that just kind of screams out within you. You're like, that's not right. That's not good. We see these people, these young people, dying, you know, very young, suffering, in pain. That should not be. And you here you see Jesus coming, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every illness and disease. In other words, Jesus agrees with you. He says, yes, that should not be. And so when he comes proclaiming the kingdom, he gives us a little taste, a little glimpse of what the kingdom is supposed to be by reversing all the illness, all the pain, all the sickness in this world and turning it right side up, right? Doesn't that make more sense? Doesn't that make more sense to say that that is the kingdom? Now, I've already tried to argue with, or well, I keep saying the word argue. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe I'm feeling argumentative. <laughs> I've tried to convince you that when we talk about the kingdom of God, it is not supposed to be something that only happens after you die, right? Kingdom of the heavens, uh, as we understand the biblical worldview of heaven, it's not just a place way up, you know, somewhere in space or in the clouds, right? But the heavens are every realm of existence, right? When it talks about the heavens and the earth, I mean, it literally means from the earth on up, right? Your atmosphere. The kingdom of the heavens, plural, is not just the heaven way up there. It's every plane of heaven, right? And so, brothers and sisters, what I want us to see in this, when we see uh, verse 24, so his uh, fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted, afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And going back to 23 that we pointed out, he healed every disease and every affliction. The word there uh, gets translated in the ESV as among. But the Greek word is N, which, what, what do you think N is? What does it sound like? N. In, right? It's every disease in the people, right? So brothers and sisters, if the kingdom of God is supposed to be everywhere, it is also in you. Now, I want to show you something. Maybe some of you are like, Pastor Steve, are you sure that's right? The kingdom of God is in us? Jesus actually says this. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 17. So Luke chapter 17, um, the Pharisees want to know when the kingdom of God is coming. Where is it? So they literally ask Jesus when the kingdom of God will come. And he answers them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Right? Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. Right? In other words, it is not only an external reality. You're not going to be able to look on the horizon and see armies coming. That's what they thought. That's what he meant by saying, look, here it is. It's coming. But he says, behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And in your Bibles, if you guys are looking at your Bibles at Luke 17, 21, you'll see that there's a footnote there. I want to show you something. I, I, I taught you this before, but maybe for some people who weren't here. Whenever you see a footnote in your Bible and it says, or, sometimes it'll say some manuscripts, which means that there are different uh, versions of the Bible that they found. And some of them are later, some of them are earlier, right? Because when people copied the Bible, they didn't have photocopiers. Right? People would just write it down. And sometimes words would get om omitted. Right? So you get slightly different manuscripts. They're actually remarkably similar. But there are some differences. So sometimes they'll say some manuscripts. Right? But when they use the word or, that always means, always means, that they are giving you the literal Greek translation. That's what it means. Right? And so what the, what the, uh, every version of the Bible that you have, uh, even though we call them translations, there's always a little bit of interpretation, right? 
And so when they tell you or, it's that they took a literal Greek word and they replaced it with, with, with a, an interpretation to try to make it more understandable. And brothers and sisters, the cynical part of me, um, but, but I, I'm just being honest, we all have agendas, right? The people who uh, it, interpreted the Bible for us, they have an agenda. And so sometimes their interpretation is based on the agenda that they have, right? And so looking at this word, this is one of the words that gets uh, a little footnote, and they will tell you, or, they will tell you that, behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you is not a literal translation. The literal translation is the kingdom of God is inside you. The Greek word here is entos. It appears one other time in the New Testament. And that is when Jesus is talking about cleaning the inside of your cup. Remember how the Pharisees, they clean the outside of the cup? But Jesus says, clean the inside of the cup, right? Entos, the entos of the cup, right? That word makes no sense if you say, clean the mist of the cup. What, what the heck does that mean, right? And brothers and sisters, this is just my feeling. I'm not saying I'm right. But I think maybe the, the, the people who are, were interpreting this Bible in the ESV, they looked at this and they were like, mm, inside of you, people are going to misunderstand that. And so, or they didn't like the sound of that. And so they took the word and they made it in the mist. What the heck does that mean? The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. That can mean anything. It's here, it's there. It's... But Jesus is clearly saying, it's not over there. It's not over here. It's inside of you. It's inside of you. Brothers and sisters, if you understand that, then you understand that the kingdom of God is inside of you, that even things like illnesses can be healed and cured, right? Now, maybe some of us are like, oh, Pastor Steve, are you talking about faith healing? Now, I, I want to demystify this a little bit. I know we see some of these things that sound very fantastic to us, but let, let's take a look at, again, um, going back uh, to where it's talking about all these different illnesses. You will notice there's a major category of illness that is not included in this list at least not literally, right? Take a look, right? We see diseases and pains, physical things, those oppressed by demons, whatever the heck that is, right? What is being oppressed by a demon? Those having seizures, paralytics, and he healed them. You never see in, uh, uh, the, in the Bible any talk about mental illness, why? Because the way that people understood mental illness in that time were demons and spirits, right? Now, I've heard some people say, oh, well, we know better, right? That, that's kind of some sort of, you know, uh, uh, a superstitional understanding. There's this kind of old way of looking at the world of spirits and things like that. But brothers and sisters, remember some of the, the, the um, stories that you hear about evil spirits, Right? Do you remember the story about the boy that um, was possessed by an evil spirit? And the spirit would take him and throw him on the ground, and he would hurt himself. And this boy sometimes would get thrown into fire, and he would get burned. Or he would get thrown into water to try to drown him. Right? And so Jesus is asked by this desperate father, Can you drive out this spirit? I mentioned this last week. What do spirits do? The Holy Spirit, right? I sang the little clip of the song, Oceans. You guys know that song? Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. I'm going to do this every week until we get it. <laughs> it's just fun to sing. Spirit, lead me. This is what spirits do. They lead you, right? Now, we look at that and we're like, evil spirits, oh, that's such an old way of thinking. But can you imagine, you're a father of a young boy, and that boy cannot help but shake, cannot help but try to hurt himself. There have been times where, I may not have called it possession, but I've been so upset at myself that I couldn't help but hit my own head 
or punch a wall and hurt myself. I once punched uh, my steering wheel so hard, I seriously thought I broke my hands. And there's a part of me that's like, Steve, you are so stupid. Why did you do that? Right? But what is the, the inevitable response? I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I was being led. I was being led by the Spirit. Do you ever see people hurt other people? Do you see people in this world? Right? Maybe someone gets so mad that they ram someone with their car. They get so mad that they punch someone in the face. And they cause incredible harm. And usually when that person is sober-minded, they're clear-minded, they've calmed down. They're like, I don't know what came over me. It's like there was a spirit that came over me. So whatever you want to call it, mental illness, an evil spirit, there are things that are leading us, not in the direction of life, but leading us in the direction of death and destruction. Do you think that people in Jesus' time suffered from mental illness? I know they did. You know how you know they did? Because later, and we're going to go over this in a few weeks, Jesus has an extended uh, a lesson about worry and anxiety. And that is the continuum, friends, of mental illness. It is, right? I mean, it, it becomes extreme in many people. And so even though in the Bible they don't use the words mental illness because it wasn't in their vocabulary, they would use words like demonic possession, evil spirits, right? Whatever you want to call it. I mean, there are times where I'm kind of convinced it is something that, that is very dark that is happening to people. And this comes from someone who suffered from mental illness most of my adult life. And there are times where I would cry and pray and just wonder, why can't I get over this? Why can't I stop this? And brothers and sisters, this is the lesson. We are not as strong as we think we are. Our kingdoms are not as powerful as we think they are. This is what we're taught in the secular worldview. You are your own king. And you rule your kingdom. We just wouldn't use those words, right? You are in charge of your own destiny. You're in charge of your own mental health. You're in charge of all the things related to your happiness and your well-being. And all you got to do is choose. You, you, you just have to will yourself. And there's so many people that, that, you know, if you've lived enough life, you know that's not true. That, that somehow we think that some people are just weak. You know, there's something wrong with you. If you were just stronger willed, you would be able to overcome these things. And, and I think the biblical worldview is probably more correct than our secular worldview. It seems as if there is a spirit that is stronger than me. I cannot drive it out on my own. I cannot overcome it on, I, on my own. I've tried. I've seen therapists. I try to think happy thoughts. I try to fix my external circumstance. I try to sleep more. I try to eat better. Nothing works. Maybe it just gets a little bit better, but nothing works. By the way, brothers and sisters, you know, I mentioned this, and, and hopefully all these things will start coming together. Remember uh, a few weeks ago, I talked about how, uh, by some estimates, uh, one Harvard doctor gave the estimate of over 80% of all the illnesses and diseases, uh, of all of our hospital uh, visits are stress-related. All of our hospital visits, 80% of them, almost all of them, are stress-related in some sense, right? What we are learning about uh, our bodies uh, is that we are much more interconnected than we think. Western medicine traditionally has treated the body like it's a machine. It's like, a, like we're auto mechanics. And to be honest, a lot of our old understanding of health has been based on a very fixed model, right? We have this thing called genetics. Genetics is this thing that is very, very, it's just very fatalistic. It's like you have genes, they get expressed, and depending on what your genes were, when they got passed down to you, you're doomed, <laughs> right? You're either doomed or, you know, maybe you won the genetic lottery and you will be healthy. But no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. 
And actually, what a lot of researchers are finding is that that's not true. There's a whole new field of study. It's called epigenetics, right? It's called this kind of external genetics, this idea that all of the things that we experience in life, and I mean all of them, have a way of switching on or turning off genes, right? And so um, th there are people that maybe are under chronic stress, and that chronic stress causes more heart disease, more problems, or causes, uh, you know, maybe some people get cancer, some people don't, but the people who happen to be under pervasive stress and experience that pervasive stress end up uh, having uh, shorter prognoses, you know, have shorter lives, are, are more likely to die younger uh, when they have cancer and different diseases, right? Um, I, I shared this uh, over the summer that they did this study about patients and people who are very impatient that they studied their telomeres. They measured their telomeres. Telomeres are the little caps on the end of your chromosomes. And it is one way of telling how long you're going to live. People with shorter telomeres tend to live shorter lives. And what they found were impatient people had shorter telomeres, right? All of these things are connected. So if you understand this, what, what, what are all these things that we're talking about? If we were to live in a kingdom, in a, a reality, in an environment where we are not the ones in control, where that secular story that you hear, that there is no God, or even if you believe in a God, maybe God has no impact on this world. It's all up to you and random dumb luck and chance. Maybe you'll just get unlucky and die today. <laughs> or maybe you'll get lucky and you'll live a long life. That's the secular world. And it is freaking scary, guys. That kind of world, oh my gosh, you're always under stress. You never know what's going to happen to you. Everything depends on you. And so for many of us, we live in that pervasive way of being. And we just worry all the time. We're just worrying. Ah, 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 what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And it affects everything, right? It affects your health. It affects your ability to be generous and to be loving and to connect with other people, right? Oh my goodness, it, it affects so many things. It affects your sleep, right? Which then affects your mood, which if, oh, it, it just spirals, right? What if, what if this were true? There is a kingdom, a way of being where you know, not just know here, but in every fiber of your being, your nervous system believes that God is in control. Your nervous system believes that God is king. Your nervous system believes that you are a child of God and you are beloved. So you literally don't have to worry. This is why. Christ's followers always look so different than the rest of the world. We always looked a little weird. <laughs> you know, there are people that just, just weren't as worried. They weren't as stressed. I mean, literally, Christians would be getting murdered and they would have smiles on their faces. It's so weird. It's something we do not understand. But it's something I'm starting to understand more. What does it take to live in a different environment and world? Does it take prayer? Yeah, I think so. But maybe the kind of prayer, not the kind of prayer that we think. I, I was looking up with a lot of hope, uh, different medical studies on prayer, because there's been a lot. <laughs> a lot of people have studied prayer because many people anecdotally have found that prayer helps, right? That they've been healed. And so they've, they've done these, like, these, these huge, wide, cross-sectional studies on prayer. And one that happened, uh, um, I think, in 2005. They did all these studies on prayer for people with heart issues, heart problems, right? And what they found was, da 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 drum roll, please. The findings were completely inconclusive. <laughs> but there was one finding that I was very disturbed by that I want to share with you. <laughs> what they found is that when they told people who were recovering from some kind of heart operation or some kind of heart attack, uh, when they told them that someone is praying for you, they found that the complications went up. <laughs> like, what? And actually, so, so they, they, they were like very curious about that. They're like, this doesn't make any sense. 
Right? And so what they hypothesize is that the reason why they went up is because people felt pressure. Right? Like, you know, maybe there's someone who goes to church and they believe in prayer. And someone's like, hey, we're doing a cross-sectional study. It's groundbreaking, right? We're trying to see if prayer works. So we're going to pray for you. I hope you get better. And you're like, oh my gosh, the fate of Christianity lies in my hands in getting better. Right? You think it's all up to you. And so then what happens? Worry, stress. I got to heal. I got to heal. I got to heal. Right? That, brothers and sisters, is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not the place where you are in control. It is the place where God is in control, right? And so that study, as backwards as it seems, it kind of proves the point. When we think it all depends on us, it somehow doesn't go as well. But when we are able, as we said last week, to let go of the control over our lives, we find there are much less reasons to worry than we think. And as we start to live in that kind of world and reality where God is in control, there are changes in our lives. This is the reason why I share this every week, just about every week. I sound like a broken record. I'm kind of like the same way about my diet, right? Pastor Steve, will you shut up about the kingdom? Will you preach about something else? Like, no, I'm not going to. This is the most transformational thing in my life. There was a time in my life, I'm just being honest, where I would get up here and I would share things I didn't really believe. I was just an actor. I would try really hard to convince you, you got to believe in it because it's the Bible. You know, I'd get up here and I'd shout and I'd pound the podium. Uh, my, my, my pastor friend used to say, um, the weaker the point, the, the harder you pound the podium, right? <laughs> to just try really hard. It's, it's the truth. The Bible says so, right? It's like, but I don't really believe it. I haven't really seen that in my life. But the more that I've been learning to pray, the more that I've been learning to get into that, that frame of mind of the kingdom. And brothers and sisters, I mean, literally, the way you get into the kingdom, as we mentioned last week, is you have to surrender. That's how you get, become a part of a new kingdom. Right? If you are being conquered by a new king, <laughs> and you're like, okay, okay, cool, I want to be a part of your kingdom, but you continue to rule and reign as if you are in control, you are not a part of that new kingdom. So the first thing you must do is lay down the control. This is why we talk about prayer, not as much about what you do, right? Remember, when the prayer didn't work, it's because that person thought it all depended on them. I got to pray in such a way, or I have to receive prayer in such a way to get a result. You don't get to determine the results anymore because you're not king. You're not in control. This is one of the marks of pe people being in the kingdom. We don't worry because we know fundamentally it's not up to us anymore. It's not some kind of flippant, you know, you, you just don't care about anything, but you really let go of that control. God in your will, in your timing. And I will learn to be a part of that rhythm of grace. And by the way, so much of our lives are about trying to manage and control that, that stress, that anxiety in your life. That if you are living in the rhythm of the kingdom of God, where God is completely in control, you will be free. You will be free. So I go to the park every day, and I'm just, I just chill with the Lord. I've just been learning to be silent before God, to let the Holy Spirit literally rearrange my nervous system. And there's so many ways that I'd be so hard on myself. I'd be running late for something at church. I'd be thinking about this message. And I come here at church, and I'm just, <laughs> I'm a nervous wreck. I feel it everywhere. I go home, and, and I'm just so tired, and I'm wiped out for the next few days. I'm, I'm really unpleasant to be around on Monday because <laughs> I'm so stressed out, so ironic. But I'm a good actor, so the next Sunday, I mean, you can't tell. You know, I get up here, praise God, hallelujah, let me tell you, believe in it because that's what the Bible says. Oh my gosh, I hit them <laughs> really hard. But brothers and sisters, <laughs> there was not a lot in my life that was really changing. 
Not really. I mean, I'm sure on some level God's grace was working. I, I don't want to put that past God. I'm not saying that God hasn't worked in your life. I'm saying in a lot of ways, things were pretty much the same. Same anger, same temper. I've shared many, many stories about road rage. If you guys have been to LGM more than two years, can you attest to my stories of road rage have decreased exponentially <laughs> in the last few months? There's a reason for that. So I don't get as much road rage. And it's not because of anything I'm doing. It's precisely because of what I'm not doing. I have let go of that control. I've learned to just be there at the park. I'll tell you too, when I went to the park, um, I used to go at a time where I knew no one would be around because they just made me nervous, right? I mean, my, my anxiety was just so high that I would go to the park and, and just every two seconds I would turn around, right? And I was just, I'm like, is there gonna be a guy just who comes up to me and tries to stab me or tries to rob me? I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's what anxiety does, right? It plays with your mind, it, there's these tricks, right? And uh, so then when I got a little bit better, I wouldn't think that all the time, but also as I'm walking around the park, because I, I would just do these prayer walks, where I'm just trying to be still with the Lord, I would put headphones on, and I wouldn't listen to any music. You know why I would put headphones on? So no one would look at me or try to talk to me, right? Headphones are this universal symbol. I'm listening to something, I don't want to talk to you, right? And so I just would have the headphones on, and sometimes it wouldn't even be plugged into anything. Right? I just didn't want to talk to anyone, you know, because I would have this anxiety when I come up to someone, I'd be like, should I say hi? Should I say hi? A Christian says hi, right? You know, but I'm praying. So should I just focus on God? Am I being unfaithful if I say hi? Because I should be, fo oh my gosh, I'm so sick, right? It's a sickness. I can't help, help but think about this stuff. But, but the more that I've let the grace of God in to that, you know, now I go to the park and, again, brothers and sisters, not because of what I'm doing, because of what I'm not doing. Now I go to the park and, you know, I'm just walking around and if I happen to see someone, if they make eye contact, I'll say hi. If they don't, I won't. No anxiety. I don't feel anxiety about that. I am not by any means have I fully arrived, right? But I'm like that person who, you know, has started to experience um, some of the results in their diet, and just every day you step on the scale, and you're like, oh, more weight is gone. Oh my gosh, and you're just so excited about it. You just want to share, right? And I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived in my spiritual life. But I've seen what God is doing. I've seen the goodness of his kingdom, and I want more. And I can't help but share it. I can't help but share it. I want you to know that as well. Can we have the praise team come up? And I want to give us uh, uh, some time to just spend in silence before God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have said this before, but it bears repeating that for many of us, being a part of the kingdom of God, it cannot just be one and done because you spend the vast majority of the time in this world, in the kingdom of anxiety and stress, and you're vibrating with anxiety and stress all around you. You're vibrating with the values of this world that are telling you, you have to achieve, you have to compete. They're teaching your mind to critique and judge and grasp and go after all this stuff, and there is no peace there. And so for a moment, I want to invite you into a different kind of space. This is what we should be doing at church. This is what we invite you to do when we say repent. This is what I invite you to when we do that offering prayer. Take a few moments, you know, maybe just take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth, and just know in this place, you don't have to worry. You don't have to stress. God is in control. Be reminded of the truth that you are God's child. That's it. That's all there is to it. But the problem is, is that your nervous system doesn't believe me yet. It's so addicted to all of the things that it's getting from this environment. It's so used to stressing and worrying that the moment that your mind starts to quiet down, <laughs> it tries to find something to feed on, 
It's like, what, what am I supposed to worry about? <laughs> no, this isn't right. This is right. I can't stand still. So we have to learn more and more. We have to train our bodies and our minds to just be still and know that He is God. Be still and know in every fiber of your being. What is it that you're worrying about? Now, I'm not asking you to, to control that because you can't. Worrying about it does not add one cubit to your life, to your span of life. Worrying about it does not change your grade at all. Worrying about it does not improve your credit score. <laughs> it does not earn you more money. All it does is deteriorate your spiritual, your mental, your emotional life. That's all it does, brothers and sisters. Can you let go? Can you just be still in this moment? It may not feel like anything is happening. But if you could do this, 20 minutes every day, just be still. You're going to be bad at it. <laughs> You're going to be really distracted. But the more and more you do it, the more and more you learn to be still in the presence of God, the more He will reorder your internal life. The kingdom of God is within you. It's inside of you. It's in your nervous system. He wants to rule and reign there. He's right here. Precious God, this is the reality that we want to live more and more. To know the goodness of your kingdom. May your kingdom come. May our kingdom go. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.